So uh, it's great to uh, see so many people uh, interested in this uh, topic. And um, uh, this is the first of uh, three uh, sessions that are going to be looking at the specific methods of synthesis that are favoured by the uh, Cochrane Qualitative and Implementation Methods Group. Uh, so uh, by the end of these three sessions, if you're able to access them live or um, in recording, uh, you will have a good overview of your methodological choices with regard to qualitative synthesis. So I have no um, actual or potential conflicts of interest, although I am a co-originator of Best Fit Framework Synthesis, but I um, don't get any money from it. It's a, uh, it's a method in the public domain. Um, and so, so this is where we fit in. We've taken you already through the uh, overview of qualitative synthesis, through question formulation and searching, through selecting studies and assessing methodological limitations. And all of these are available as uh, uh, video presentations for you to actually access at your leisure. And uh, as has been mentioned, two more on synthesis and then one on grade circle and another one on bringing it all together with quantitative uh, evidence. Um, and, and just uh, to orientate those of you who are coming to this completely um, fresh, um, that uh, there are some key sources. There's, there's an excellent um, uh, uh, paper um, published uh, recently uh, by Brunton and colleagues um, at the uh, epicenter, as, as was at the time, um, and uh, they have provided a, an overview of framework synthesis. It does uh, mention best fit framework synthesis as one of the uh, options, uh, but if you're specifically interested in that, and that will be the latter half of today's presentation, uh, then uh, there's a set of three articles that myself, Chris Carroll, and other colleagues here in Sheffield um, have written to uh, develop and uh, introduce the method. Um, and uh, it's, at this point, it's timely to say that uh, much of the material that I'll be featuring today, as with uh, other um, presentations in this series, is um, derived from the uh, forthcoming um, qualitative evidence synthesis uh, methods handbook um, that uh, Jane Noyes and, and Angela Harden are editing, to which we're contributing, specifically in this case, chapter nine on framework synthesis. And we're really looking forward to being able to put down a, a method logical marker uh, on some of these methods at that point. So I'm going to take you through a, a session that falls into two halves. Um, I'm going to introduce what is framework synthesis, uh, just briefly mention some of the principles behind it, strengths and limitations. Uh, one of the str strengths of Cochrane as a, uh, an organisation is that we're not um, blind or even double blind to the limitations of our methodologies. And so we want to give an accurate appraisal of what it's good for and what it isn't good for. Um, and, and just to mention some recent applications of framework synthesis and how it's been broadening out from its ori original origins. And then uh, the second half will specifically um, focus on best fit framework synthesis and then some generic um, techniques that you might find helpful. First of all, in how do you identify candidate frameworks? And then secondly, how do you uh, select and appraise them? And there will be opportunities for questions at the end of each half. So let's uh, start then with what is framework synthesis. Um, uh, and before that, we really need to put down some markers on um, the difference between theory, model and framework. Uh, and, and for me, um, my go to article is this one by Nielsen, because within a short space of a couple of paragraphs, um, uh, that there are definitions of these three. Uh, so uh, a theory um, starting with them, perhaps the most complex, is, is a, a set of uh, analytical principles or statements which um, help to provide a, an explanation of specific relationships and how they lead to specific events. So the, th the theory very much uh, is composed um, of the, the explanations and some way, either textual or graphical, of presenting the relationships. Now, a model may present those relationships. Um, they tend to have a, a, a narrower scope um, and it tends to be more descriptive. Uh, and, and so it's not unusual to have a model presented alongside a theory. Um, the model is partly intuitive. That a good model, you'll be able to uh, work out what it's trying to depict. But it's really the theory that, if you like, fills in the, the mortar um, around the, the bricks of the model. 
Now, a framework is, is I tend to think of it as more of an outline or more of a linear um, uh, structure. Um, and, and very often it just labels the components without focusing very much on the relationships before them. So, so if you like, we're starting with the most advanced at the top of the, the screen here and going to the simplest version. Um, and obviously you can build up from a framework, um, just listing the variables to a model where you start to think about the relationships and then you have an overarching explanation. Now, now, this is deliberately being kept uh, simple. There, there, are, there are volumes of writings on the difference between these. Um, but it, it, to my simple brain, a framework tends to be quite static. Um, a model starts to show those relationships. And then a theory provides that explanation that goes beyond the description as to how those relationships work in the broadest sense. So on the left hand side, we have a framework, you'll see brain, eye, mouth, stomach, um, it contains the four elements that we're interested in here. Um, you'll notice they're in alphabetical order. So there's no relationship um, there. Although um, uh, just by coincidence, they happen to the, be the order from from top to bottom in the human body. Um, but we haven't really thought about about relationships. Um, a model, however, starts to think about what interacts with what. And at the simplest level, we've got a, a pathway. Um, the eye, in this case, sees the ice cream that uh, triggers um, some memories in the brain. The ice cream is, is uh, tasty. Um, we then uh, turn that into action. Um, the black box in between there, we put it in our mouth and it ends up in our stomach. Um, now that's a very simple um, model. And of course, what it doesn't have is any of these iterative um, loops. So for example, a bad experience with ice cream might mean that we would never have that flavor again. So this is a very sort of simple and linear model, but usually they would be more complicated. Um, and so a descriptive model would be the eye sees the ice cream, the eye sends the signals to the brain, the brain pictures the ice cream as desirable, et cetera, et cetera. And we would call that a program theory because it's just an explanation of how this thing is working. Um, but um, you could have a more um, a higher level conceptual uh, theory that might be something based on this same data, but something like past experience shapes future preference and expectations. So the experience of an ice cream in the past um, decides, helps us decide whether we're going to have another ice cream. And that's more mid range because you can imagine that past experience, say, for example, of a Caribbean cruise may help one decide whether one's going to go on a similar cruise or pick something entirely different. So um, what is framework synthesis then? Well, it harnesses theories, models, or frameworks, and it's versatile to be able to use all, uh, any of those three um, uh, as a way of providing a structure and a lens on the data. And it's adapted from framework um, uh, analysis. Some of you will be familiar with that from primary qualitative research. Um, and so you form a research question, you investigate the theoretical literature around that issue to produce an a priori conceptual framework. And that framework becomes, uh, in some cases, a scaffold against which um, you can uh, place the, uh, the data that you've got to um, to organize it, to bring it together in the synthesis and to organize it in the analysis. And it's very flexible um, because um, not only can it um, uh, handle data that uh, is um, explained um, uh, uh, by the existing um, framework, um, but it, it can be adapted to take on new data that uh, um, lies uh, on the edge of or outside the framework. So, so that's that's the um, the, the, the sort of uh, process behind it. And these frameworks or models can um, take different formats. So um, a very quick search um, uh, uh, revealed to me a recent example where someone had produced a conceptual framework of access to healthcare. So this is um, at that sort of more conceptual um, mid-range level to try and explain how people access services. And we, we can think of it as being mid-range mid because it would 
um, apply to multiple healthcare contexts and some of those elements um, like equality um, and um, availability might well apply to other contexts, say to uh, access to schools or to um, uh, access to um, uh, uh, social care payments, for example. Then you've got uh, policy frameworks. These are, are loved by modernization agencies and various uh, change agencies within the health service. Um, and these are very often just a, um, a schema, uh, a process through which you go through in order to achieve a desired end. So the example there from our own work is, a, is a, from protocol-based care, where the NHS modernization agency specified the stages that one would go through uh, in producing a, a a reliable protocol. Then we have logic models. These can be designed around a particular problem. Uh, and as uh, my colleagues in Germany have uh, indicated, um, these can be structural logic models, which show you how a thing is organized, or they can uh, be process logic models, which tell you how things develop um, either in a developmental way or uh, uh, over time. And, and it, by using uh, that sort of idea of process, uh, we can extend that to cover such things as disease trajectories. So you could have a framework that shows the stages of a disease and map data to those different stages. Or you could have a care pathway and map data according to the diagnosis, the treatment, the rehabilitation, etc. And then at an even simpler level, you can create your own frameworks um, through matrices. Um, you could, for example, have matrices that have descriptive variables in rows or columns, or you could have um, thematic variables, different themes, um, or you could combine the two. So, for example, showing um, uh, the uh, interaction between, um, uh, say, region of the world and um, the experience of stigma uh, as, as respective columns and rows. And these frameworks uh, can come from a number of uh, source documents, uh, more of that later. They can come from primary studies, from uh, reviews and from policy documents. And of course, those three sources have different virtues. Primary study, closeness to the data, review the sense that it's not just a single view, but it's, a, uh, it's an aggregation of views and policy documents um, in terms of credibility to the audience not always the case of government policy, um, we could say at the moment, um, but um, they, they also have limitations in that a policy document may indicate how things are meant to be rather than how things actually operate in practice. If we're thinking about the family tree of um, the framework approaches, um, there are three uh, main uh, strands to this. Um, framework analysis is the primary research version, um, best known through the work of Ritchie and Spencer, uh, and they identified these five stages, familiarization, framework identification, indexing, charting, and mapping and interpretation. Um, in the uh, middle of the um, last decade, um, we saw uh, Sandy Oliver and colleagues um, work on a version of framework synthesis that is heavily participative, that involve, to a greater or lesser extent, consultation with stakeholders to produce the frameworks. And then um, towards the uh, latter end of the um, uh, the, the next decade, um, we, we had um, our own uh, attempts, which are uh, very much based on using existing frameworks as conceived by other people uh, and uh, um, adapting those in a systematic process. Uh, and best fit framework synthesis, as we'll come to shortly, um, is specifically designed to meet some of the demands of the systematic review. So um, the five stages of framework synthesis, um, uh, drawing on the, the work of Ritchie and Spencer, uh, becoming familiar with the issue, choosing an initial framework. So this is a sort of um, starting point. It's a line in the sand, if you like. Um, then uh, starting to uh, index and then chart your data and then to map the data um, and uh, interpret it. And so uh, intuitively, this is quite a, a simple process. Obviously, it does require um, quite uh, advanced uh, analytical skills as you go through it. 
Um, and uh, that process has been charted uh, specifically to synthesis um, by uh, Ginny Brunton in the um, paper that I referenced at the beginning. Um, and you can see at the top, um, we have uh, transferring or translating these concepts from Ritchie and, and Spencer uh, to a review context. So we've got that uh, extensive process that we're all used to of um, uh, scoping the review um, that corresponds to familiarization. Um, and then there's the process of framework selection, which uh, may involve um, formal searching or it may involve a creation of a framework. Um, and then we move on to processes that are much closer to data extraction and synthesis uh, before concluding with uh, interpretation and dissemination. Um, and the uh, uh, key points that we've identified in the uh, chapter of the forthcoming handbook is that um, framework synthesis offers a synthesis that, it, that is given a, an external structure by the chosen theory. Um, it's believed to be an efficient and transparent um, way of handling data. Um, certainly, it's uh, more transparent than thematic synthesis. Um, that the selected theory may have different statuses. It may be tentative, um, or it may actually be refined or established. So it's very important to um, uh, describe the credentials of the theory that you've chosen to use. Um, we'll come on to see that best fit framework synthesis um, offers the opportunity to have a formal process of refinement or revision so that you can see a clear distinction between the original framework and the subsequent or final framework and uh, also we uh, acknowledge the importance of stakeholders almost for a sense or credibility check so that um, what is um, captured in theory is continually being tested uh, to see whether it applies to the context in which you're planning to use it. So uh, just uh, very briefly um, to um, highlight some of the principles behind the development of framework synthesis. Um, so, um, and you'll see here that although these are, uh, tend to be characteristic of, of both um, uh, framework synthesis and the variant called best fit framework synthesis, you'll see that they variously emphasize uh, different uh, principles here. So um, the idea of both of them is to be transparent and this is taken to its extreme by best fit framework synthesis with clear processes for identification and selection of the framework. It's designed to be explicit. Um, we would hope that that's true of all types of uh, synthesis and systematic review. Um, both are theory led, um, um, but when we come to the latter two points here, um, we see that um, they variously go in different directions. So consultative um, is mainly a characteristic of framework synthesis. Although having said that, um, I have recent examples where I've taken um, from best fit framework synthesis, uh, like a swatch book, a, 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 a sort of guidebook, if you like, of several candidate theories and asked um, stakeholders to select the theory that they feel resonates most with um, um, the, the phenomenon that we're exploring. So, so you can make it sort of fast track consultative within best fit framework synthesis. But it's true to say that um, framework synthesis um, builds in, as you'd expect from someone like uh, Sandy Oliver, it builds in um, this uh, very important um, engagement and, and consultation with, with um, participants, with, with people with um, views about the phenomenon. Uh, on the other side, um, with the background that we have in health technology assessment and rapid reviews, best fit framework synthesis is designed very much to be pragmatic. And, and this extends to other parts of the process um, that we won't go into so much. So for example, uh, pragmatic approaches to uh, quality assessment. So um, you've heard a, a bit from me to give you a bit of background. Uh, we're now going to invite uh, Dario to share with us a poll um, just based on um, your um, uh, initial uh, thinking about framework synthesis, if you'd like just to select your preferred uh, answer on this. Okay, so um, uh, you can see there that um, quite divided in uh, opinion, most people feel that it uh, will take about the same time 
uh, 39% of you. Um, uh, and then we have um, almost uh, symmetrically, not quite, but almost um, between more time and less time. And, and um, uh, obviously some of you are here to learn, so you have no idea. Now, um, without going into too much detail, this is one of these very rare occasions where you're all correct. And, and the reason for that is more important than what you actually selected. So, so um, on average, um, the framework synthesis would take less time. Um, and that's because uh, having the uh, labels of the framework in place um, um, can actually save on the coding process. Um, but there are two um, variables that can make it take about the same time or in extreme circumstances, more time. And so those two things for you to think about, first of all, one is the time spent to find the framework. So just as you take time to uh, scope your topic area, um, you have to take time to um, scope your framework. And so in essence, you're doing two searches rather than one. The second thing is that um, it assumes that the framework is going to work for your data from the first attempt. And so there are rare occasions when um, the framework misfires, if you like, that it doesn't turn out to be appropriate. And therefore you are faced with a choice of either choosing an alternate framework or um, reverting to something like thematic synthesis where a framework is not um, uh, considered um, uh, necessary or, or suitable. So um, hopefully you can see there that, that on the whole, we would hope that framework synthesis would be quicker. Certainly I find it quicker because I can find frameworks and a choice of frameworks quite speedily um, uh, that um, we certainly uh, wouldn't expect it to um, uh, to uh, take more time unless something goes wrong, either that there aren't frameworks there or the framework you choose is unsuitable. Um, but um, certainly, um, uh, if all goes well, you would expect it to take about the same time as the worst scenario and um, less time uh, if the framework is a good match for your data. So hopefully you can see it's not really a trick question, it's just an important question to emphasize, um, to clear up some of these um, misapprehensions. So you don't pick um, framework synthesis necessarily to do things quicker, but you could look for a framework to see whether um, uh, the, the topic area is already well theorized and whether um, you have the prospect of being able to do some speedy coding of data. So uh, let's uh, move on to some of the strengths and limitations of framework synthesis. Um, so some of the strengths um, it, it, it are that um, it uh, can tie up the, um, the structure very much with the specific questions, um, that it allows synthesis within a limited time frame and uh, issues that have been identified a priori. Um, it's a way of introducing theory um, in, in a fairly uh, amenable and, and um, uh, palatable way, if you like, because there's a clear relationship between your data and theory. In contrast to what we'll see later in the series, something like metroethnography, where it may be uh, stronger in the theory building process, but you can't always see where that's come from. Um, and uh, you're using skills that are uh, built on and are extension about the synthesis skills that you would expect to use within um, uh, any qualitative synthesis. And I'm just going to show you some of the ways that the framework can operate. So one thing is that it uh, can be a window or a, another expression is a lens. So in this particular case, I've already referred to it. Um, this is a 12-step guide from the NHS Modernization Agency on how to introduce um, protocols. And we were able to code the data from fairly thin reports um, against uh, this um, framework um, as a way of seeing um, uh, where the uh, data is concentrated. So those parts of the process that have most detail and have most nuance and those that are neglected. And so in this particular case, we spotted a gap around um, the, um, the actual um, 
uh, process of um, uh, finding the, the um, supporting evidence, step six there, gather information, that a lot of the described protocols that we reviewed um, shortcutted over that process of information gathering. Um, and another um, um, purpose for framework is to lend credibility um, and also to substantiate um, further theorizing. Um, so in this particular example, and uh, not our own, um, the, uh, the research team chose the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, which, which actually is a meta theory or meta framework. Um, and they used that as a way of um, enhancing the credibility of their review by placing their specific data um, within this more generic theory. So, in fact, it's um, serving as a first stage of dissemination. Um, another um, uh, use of um, a framework is in scaffolding. Um, so, um, this is particularly useful if um, you're using a logic model or a program theory um, where you're wanting to identify the supporting data for um, each uh, element of an intervention. Um, and uh, you're not um, necessarily um, um, at this stage uh, looking at the, um, the interrelationship of that intervention that comes in the analysis and interpretation, but you're simply trying to see what data do we have to support the different elements, maybe inputs or processes. Um, and so in this case, you, you take a logic model, you deconstitute it, which sounds a little bit like taking, taking fluid out of water and creating a powder. And then once you've done the um, data extraction, you reconstitute it to form a new, um, uh, to form a new framework. Um, and, and so that's a bit like adding liquid um, back to powder to make water again. Um, and uh, the final um, uh, purpose of a framework um, is in evaluation that so that by defining the essential elements and supporting those through data, you can actually produce a framework that you can use um, either in subsequent reviews um, or in subsequent primary research. So a visual representation of the things that need to be evaluated um, uh, so you can start to collect primary data against this framework that you developed from secondary data. So some of the limitations, we said we'd be honest, um, it, it can be time consuming, but as we've said, it may be quicker than others, particularly if, if there is some agreement in the field about uh, an appropriate framework or stakeholders push you in the direction of a framework fairly quickly. Um, it needs to consider all data and ensure a rigorous process. So, so um, you, you need to make sure that you don't use the, the um, framework or the theory to constrain the data you collect. That should still be governed by the re review question. Um, it lacks some of the theoretical development and underpinning of other qualitative approaches, and we've already contrasted with meta-ethnography. Um, the dangers are that it, um, by being so flexible, it may encourage reviewers to take shortcuts. And we've mentioned the danger of false starts. It's just worth mentioning here that one of the false starts that I, I I've, have experienced myself um, and, and which uh, I believe is a, a big danger for us is um, where you've got the right phenomenon for the framework, but it's at the wrong stage of the process. So for example, um, it might be a framework for um, prevention, but you may be interested in treatment. So the, the uh, pico, if you like, or the spice may match, but you've actually not got the, the time factor right. And, and that is one of the areas where you could have a full start with the framework. Um, and as is reported for framework analysis, it may encourage reviewers to squeeze data into existing concepts. Uh, I face this ten, uh, temptation myself that when you have a, a label um, and you then are faced with the alternative of having to devise your own new label, um, that you might be tempted to say, well, uh, you know, does it fit within the existing label 
to save me time. Um, so you need to have this very much as a team process to resist this temptation to squeeze data into an existing framework. And if you think about it, if you're doing a PhD, there's the requirement for new knowledge, for a review, you're trying to enhance an understanding. So actually, the, there are very strong motivators to not squeeze data. Uh, and because the uh, theory might belong to others, um, you might find yourself needing a code book um, for agreement between the coders um, and um, so that you get consistent uh, coding. Um, and a final warning that the framework can work as a gallows. Remember that frameworks aren't neutral. They bring values along with it. And if, for example, in a particular professional group, a framework has been um, uh, 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 discredited, if it's seen as outdate, outdated, if uh, people are tired with that particular framework, they've seen it too often, um, then the audience may um, throw away the value of your synthesis because you've picked the wrong framework. So you need to be aware of any values that are attached to your framework, as well as some of the practical considerations. And um, just uh, moving on before we um, open up to some questions, um, some recent applications of framework synthesis. Um, this is um, from um, uh, a review I've done with some Nigerian colleagues. Um, they took a framework from a World Health Organization um, a systematic review, and they were interested in saying, how does this apply to our country, to Nigeria? So they were able to see those areas where the framework corresponded, but more importantly, those areas that were um, different in the Nigerian data, or indeed whether there were contradictions. Um, and, uh, for example, they found that um, transport options um, uh, may differ across countries, so transport as a factor was important, but there was extra nuance about options, um, uh, but they also confirmed that things like um, religion were important, even if the religious mix of a country might be different from um, uh, that covered um, in other evidence. Um, in the context of rapid QES, this was the first ever um, uh, rapid Cochrane review uh, in qualitative research done by colleagues in, in Ireland. Um, and so they used um, uh, a framework adapted from previous work um, that had been uh, from primary research on how health workers um, perceived adhering to infection pre prevention guidelines. And so they judged this to be a reasonable fit for this review. And so it was able to speed up the process. So an example of where a framework exists it can well um, make uh, the prospect of rapid synthesis possible. Um, and uh, this is the a particular framework that they used. And just uh, really to note that they added one sub subdomain, they relabeled one of the subdomains as well. So this is these are the sort of things you can do um, as long as you do this transparently and make it clear how the new version differs from the old version. And then finally, we see the use of frameworks now increasingly used for um, what we're starting to see, which is uh, overviews of qualitative synthesis. Uh, here we have something called a mega aggregation, so a review of reviews. Um, and uh, in this case, it's very practical because they were trying to sort through 544 concepts from these reviews. And you can see that that would have been a, a huge uh, task uh, for something like thematic synthesis. It would have been prohibitive for something like uh, ethnography. Um, so um, they were able to use a framework approach. So I'm going to pause there for questions. Um, so, uh, Kate, is, is anything of uh, interest uh, coming up through the discussion board? Lots of interest, Andrew. Um, lots of really fantastic questions. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, we'll pick up on as many as we can now and mop up the rest at the end. Um, so one of the first questions has come from Rasha, who's asked, can I conduct the theory related search? at the same time or after I've conducted the systematic review related search to avoid choosing a framework that misfires. Okay, um, essentially they are parallel processes. Um, uh, so 
uh, one of the things that is well reported in the literature is that the research literature and the theoretical literature aren't always um, overlapping. So, for example, if you used um, uh, filters like for qualitative research or for uh, quantitative research, you might be deliberately excluding, even though you or not deliberately, unintentionally excluding um, the conceptual work there. So, so it's best to conceive them as two separate searches. Um, in terms of the order in which to do, um, it, it really needs you to, to do as implied by the question, which is to think of the threats to, to um, bias there. Um, uh, one could argue that if you had um, a choice of frameworks, then actually um, the, 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 the choice itself is a pre prevention or a protection against um, focusing on one. So, so um, I, I, I would say that you should um, think carefully about your topic and the value of frameworks within it, and then you can either do a followed by B, B followed by A, or do them at, at about the same time. But the main point is that they, these may well be different literatures, although um, um, just because the conceptual literature may be separate doesn't stop it actually being included in your empirical studies. And so a quick thing you can do is, is search through your reference management database for your review for words like theory, framework, concept to see if um, any of those have come up in the empirical research as well. That's great. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and a question from Tamarind, and apologies if I've mispronounced your name. Um, is it correct to assume that the four framework purposes that you outlined overlap um, or or how do the different functions overlap if, if not all four? Right uh, so some of them relate to different stages of the process so certainly yes they, they, they can be complementary to each other so um, we find that we can use frameworks to stimulate discussion at the early part of the project so it, it's acting more as the window um, but then we use it practically as um, to construct our data extraction form um, so certainly they're not designed to be mutually exclusive um, on, on the other hand, um, it's quite legitimate to say we, we need a framework specifically just for this purpose um, and, and not to uh, need to take it um, uh, any further. So, for example, you could use a framework just to initiate discussion amongst stakeholders about the important issues, and it might not then be part of the technical process of the, um, of, of the review. So, so I, I, again, I mean, the, 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 the phrase that Ginny Brunson is particularly keen on is this is a really flexible method. It's, in fact, it's really a toolkit or toolbox rather than a prescribed uh, method. Thank you. And final question for now. We've had um, a few things come up in the chat box around actually um, finding your framework and, and ensuring it's the right framework. And there's been a question asked, is there an objective standard to judge whether a framework or model is appropriate or how can we judge it as appropriate? And shared, Jane shared some of our guidance in the chat box as well, but this is a specific question. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, Jane's had a long-standing interest in, in the role of um, theory and how that designs the review methods. I've got a couple of slides of, of tentative. The answer is no, there's not objective because no one sat down and designed it specifically for this purpose. What I have found is several examples where people have designed these sort of evaluation frameworks for other purposes. And so I'm going to share those with people at the very end of my presentation. So yes, it's an absolutely important issue. How do you judge whether a framework is is conceptually mm. fit not just practically fit and i've got a few suggestions at the end of the presentation Brilliant. Yeah, and ju you. just to add to that andrew in in our cochrane guidance that the link i've put in the chat we do actually put some factors to consider mm -hmm. um, when making judgments about the fit of the framework to the data and purpose um, and again we glean that through a review of the literature and getting great great peer review feedback on our guidance so have a look and it, you know that's a starting point Excellent. Yeah. So, so um, there's a nice little um, re uh, international research project to be done there about um, uh, uh, choosing a, a, an appropriate instrument. But as I say, I've got a few um, uh, tools that, uh, where other people have done something similar.